We are very pleased to have Dr. Habib Shodari with us today. He has extensive research experience in the field of environmental gerontology. His projects have been funded by Canadian Institute of Health Research, Social Science and Humanities Research Council, Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, Capital Care Foundation, and the Center for Health Design. His work includes research and consulting that focuses on the physical environment for people with dementia in long-term care facilities, age and dementia-friendly communities. His published books include Environments in an Aging Society, Autobiographical Perspectives in Environmental Gerontology from Springer Publications, and Remembering Home, Rediscovering the Self and Dementia with John Hopkins University Press. He works with national and international organizations in the areas of planning and design of senior housing and long-term care facilities. Last year, he received career award from Environment Design Research Association. And currently, he serves as the editor-in-chief of Journal of Aging and Environment. He also serves as a member of the on the Ministerial Advisory Board on Dementia for Government of Canada and as a vice chair of the Institute of Aging Advisory Board at the Canadian Institute of Health Research. Welcome, Habib. We are very excited for your presentation. Great. Thank you so much, Peggy. Great to be here. I want to first thank Peggy, Whitney, and Sarah for organizing this series of seminars. I'm glad to be part of this. So I'm great to see some of the colleagues here, some of the names I recognize. So wonderful to see you here. And thank you, everyone, for joining us and making time for this. Interesting time for Canada, for many countries after the pandemic, especially in Canada, as many of you know. Uh, there have been quite a bit of work that has gone into creating standards uh, of uh, long-term care and two reports, uh, HSO and CSA reports that have come out in the recent past. So these are, uh, these are policy level first steps, important steps, and now it's up to the provincial governments and uh, other authorities to really implement some of that. Um, so that's that's an exciting window of opportunity that we're going through. So two two substantial things, substantive things that I want to mention before I get started. One is, as many of you again know, that when we talk about care homes, about 60 to 70 percent, in some cases, 80 percent people, residents who are living in care homes have some level of dementia. So this is uh, this is we cannot talk about environments for environments in long-term care without talking about dementia. On the other hand, it's also important to note when we talk about design or good design for people with dementia, most of the time they're also relevant, responsive for people who do not have dementia as well. So there's an overlap of a lot of the things we talk about for people who are cognitive intact as well. So these are relevant for long-term care in general, but especially for people with dementia, these are even more important. So in, in this presentation, I would like to cover uh, four issues. Very briefly, I'll talk about the physical environment and long-term care as a context, and then really spend most of the time talking about design principles, some selected principles, and some illustrations, highlighting those principles. And then I will talk about two of our projects that we have been working on in, in um, Canada, in BC, one is uh, a new tool that we have developed, person-oriented environmental tool, or POET in short. And also, more recently, we have created an educational game for uh, LTC staff, and the game is called Creating Home. All right, let's begin. So this is just to set us uh, the, the same page and where how we think about uh, and the physical environment, what we have been doing for the last few decades from the 60s onwards in North America. This is a typical care home built circa 1975. And these are the typical uh, elements, architectural elements that we see in most care homes in some variety or other. One is the long corridor is quite often is very long and it's kind of confusing for wayfinding orientation. There's a dominant nurse's station that you can see right in the middle that supports surveillance or observation. And that's a very acute care model based uh, principle that we see in long-term care. We have a central dining space, we have a central activity space, we have a double, double occupancy rooms. So these are very typical um, 
architectural principles that we see that are carry over from, in some ways, from the acute care model in most of the care homes in North America. So when we talk about, um, when we're talking about um, design, responsive design for people with dementia in care homes, this is the broad umbrella, the broad principle of home versus institution or more relevant moving onward, moving on from care home to uh, a care home that is somebody's home rather than institution. And we can talk about in detail about how these two, if, if I ask you, where would you like to live? I'm sure you will select probably the right-hand side, not the left-hand side um, resident room. So this is, this is the, the overall goal from physical design. So when we talk about supportive physical environment, we, we generally talk about a few things. Number one is that positive physical environment can reduce responsive emotions, behaviors. So these are common aspects that care staff face. We know that, that residents experience some level of anxiety, confusion, vocational agitation, and so on. Environment has a role to play supports remaining cognitive and functional abilities. So this is a really important one and we need to do a lot of work in to look at the capacity moving away from the narrative of deficit to a narrative of capacity and how can the environment support cognitive and functional abilities that are still remaining in people with dementia. Engage in a familiar lifestyle-based activity. So these, this is getting into more of the positive side of things. Okay, we talk about how do we respond to emotions, behaviors, um, that are that need to be addressed, and then cognitive and functioning abilities, but also familiar lifestyle-based activities, which are about positive act activities, engagement, and self-directed behaviors. What role does an environment have in that context? And overall, the the broader context to provide a sense of comfort, sense of security, psychological security, and comfort, and continuity. So when we think about long-term care home, it is critically important that we talk about the different components of a care home. So we obviously start with people with dementia, and this is going into, if you are running a care home, we talk about what level of dementia we are talking about. Do you have all levels? And then their physical functioning status, and then the importance of life history, their values, preferences, cultural background, and so on the organization and program, the policies and regulations. So there's a lot of work that has been going on in this area, which is about culture change and how we talk about culture change, moving away from the medical model, predominantly medical model of care to a more social model of care, person-centered care model, relationship-centered model of care. So that's where this is where, this is where those would fit in, uh, staffing models, staff training, policies, culture, and so on. And then what happens on the ground, the social environment, right? The care practices, uh, what, what role, what, uh, how can we empower the direct care staff? That's one of the ongoing challenges that we are facing. And then ultimately social interaction at many levels, not only planned activities and personal care, but informal social interactions. So that's part of the social environment. And of course, we're talking about physical environment in this session, but the important thing to realize that I'm trying to communicate on this slide is these are interrelated concepts. We can have a, a really cutting edge response to physical environment, but unless we're addressing the organizational programmatic issues, social environment, we are not gonna maximize the benefits of a positive physical environment. So they all work together to create a person-centered care, relationship-centered care model. So when we look at the literature, we have different uh, scholars talking about researchers talking about different design principles. I'm using or drawing from some of the more common design principles from Cohen and Wiseman going back to the early 90s. And we're not going to talk about all 10, but I'll, I'll touch on um, the first, the top four. But these are more commonly considered, um, um, discussed, implemented design principles. So um, when you talk about design in long-term care, um, with, the, with the context of the needs of people with dementia. So this first principle is the foundational principle that impacts many other principles. So this is like really the, the, really the, the platform 
uh, upon which others are built upon to create a familiar environment based on residents' past homes and neighborhoods. So this, this goes back to the issue in many dementia, especially in Alzheimer's, we know people's reality is quite often past oriented in terms of where, what they think, what they remember in terms of going back in time and their young adulthood, early childhood and the familiarity of the home. So that, that, that environmental context of home, that familiar, familiar context of home is a very powerful cue, powerful connection to what could be done and what the lifestyle could be. So that's basically the broad idea here. Um, and and th this is where I, I would say most of the research is actually, uh, a lot of research has been done in this particular aspect of unit size. And, and I'm just giving a snippet of what, what the literature is talking us, giving us information and evidence, just to give you an idea. We know that unit size smaller is better. What is a smaller unit size? Well, I mean, for this, some of the studies that I'm talking about, they talked about larger units being 30 plus residents and the smaller units could be beyond lower than 30 plus. But in reality, in, in practice, we talk about 10 to 12 residents, eight to 10, 12, kind of pushing the limit would be a small, um, small unit. So this is again, some snippet of some of the evidence that we know as for the studies comparing large units to small units. And then these findings are coming up. For example, increased agitation aggression in larger units, space invasion, for example, getting into somebody else's rooms. When you have long corridors and people have difficulty wayfinding and have anxiety, they will most likely get into other people's rooms. So this happens every day in many care homes. So that's what we can call space invasion or space um, uh, appropriation. Territorial conflicts, again, connected to space invasion, but also related to other spaces in lounges, in, um, in dining rooms about territorial um, challenges and, and interactions. In smaller units, again, as I said, 18 would be kind of coming from some of those studies, but in more recent past, for many years, we are talking about around eight to 10 and uh, up to 12 potentially. Um, less cognitive decline. It's again, compared to smaller to larger units and smaller units residents uh, show less cognitive decline, which is an important finding. Increased social engagement, number of studies, including our team studies found that both in terms of planned activity engagement, as well as informal social interactions are um, noted as higher in smaller units than larger units. The, the many, some of several studies done in the US on, on greenhouses, for example, and, and a few studies also in Canada talk about quality of life domains. So privacy, dignity, food enjoyment, and so on are higher, uh, scored higher in smaller units compared to larger units. Fewer declines in ADL, this is a Canadian study, uh, fewer declines in ADL dependence and less negative affect. And then there's a few studies uh, that talk about uh, psychotropic drug use of uh, use of reduced psychotropic drug uh, drugs in um, smaller units. And these, the last one is you know you can connect with some of the things we talked about: the increased social engagement, less anxiety, and so on. Would naturally would connect to one could assume that yes, potentially people would need need less sedation, and that is that has been documented by a few studies. So this is, a, this is a care home that is actually where I'm located near Vancouver, um, which is one of the care homes that uh, is, is, has embraced the household model. So just a quick overview of what we're looking at. This facility started with 36 beds, 36 um, residents, and now it's 72. So they have three, they have six households I'm showing three households here. Each household has 12 residents um, and with slightly different design. So this is, this is this this goes back to what I've been talking about last few slides about smaller units, right? So now we're looking at how those smaller units could look like. This is just one example. It's a 12 resident uh, unit. And even within this 12 resident unit, you have uh, subdivisions of six and six. So on one side, you've got six residents, they have their own living and dining space. Another side, they have resident, six resident rooms and also their own living and dining space. In the middle, you have common kitchen. So this is, 
Uh, without getting into too many details, the, the main concept is about that household, smaller household. In this case, even the smaller household is divided into two separate sections, each having their own living and dining. And sometimes they have activities together in one side of this household that most of the residents would be on one side having activities, but they do have meals on the, each of the, the separate sides. There's a walking path. And as you can see, there's also a nice landscaped um, space, which is quite well used during summer months. Going back to the, the daycare home that I, I was showing earlier, this was a project where there was an intervention done and I'm just going to show quickly what the intervention resulted in. So this, uh, so this is what we had. This is after renovation. This is going back several years. Uh, similar projects are also happening in 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 BC as well. Some uh, I don't have the images that I can show right now, but very similar modifications we are doing in those projects. In this particular project, the the goal was to create households. Uh, but before I talk about the households, one was the replacing the nurse's station with an aviary. So the nurse's station was replaced from this dominant location to the side on the side. If you can follow my cursor here, that's where the nurse's station or nurse's workspace was located to really uh, you know, lessen the impact of a medical model, an institutional setting. Um, but more importantly, the taking out some of the rooms here and creating a dining and activity space. So this is basically decentralizing dining and creating a household, three households on each floor. And there were six households on the two floors. So this particular section had 16 residents, this one has 16 residents, and there was a new addition of nine residents uh, on the other side. So, um, and we, for this project, there was some pre and post evaluation done, which was published in the study that's uh, underlined uh, on the slide. So, um, so the point being that, yes, we are, we have thousands of care homes in North America and something can be done with these care homes. It doesn't need to be this major, but there's a potential in some cases to, if, if the organization is willing to and the, and the resources are available, then uh, it could, there could be a plan to create households by major modifications, renovations. Um, these are some images, again, going back to the uh, issue of uh, institutional versus non-institutional home-like setting. When we talk about home-like setting, we also talk about the importance of smaller dining space. What I'm showing now is what we typically have in many, many settings, many care homes. These are large dining rooms which create a lot of sensory overstimulation. So sensory overstimulation takes place because of the number of people there. Quite often there are 30, 40 people, sometimes more. There's a lot of noise, a lot of environmental stimulation from lighting, from furnishing, et cetera, uh, that create um, overstimulation, especially for people with dementia. And that can easily create a level of anxiety and agitation. When we talk about uh, what is an alternative in the context of uh, dining spaces, these are some of the examples uh, from Europe um, that show the smaller dining space, more home-like dining space. If you look at these two examples, you see that there's a dining table for six people, eight people, um, and on the right-hand side, on the left-hand side, there are two tables, each for four to six people, and then they have an accessible kitchen. And in this particular case, they actually prepare meals on site. This is in Sweden. Um, and, 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 and they have meals. And that's a whole another issue, that opportunity for cooking um, is quite possible if the kitchen is accessible. And that also is a larger organizational issue, obviously, about you know, staff being able to cook, volunteers being available to make those, the, uh, those meals taking place. But the, that if that can be done properly, that really opens up a lot of lifestyle-based activities for the residents that are connected to their, their past lives, their, their, their lifelong habits. So um, yeah, along the lines of uh, familiar spaces, this, this is a care home uh, kitchen in, uh, in Germany. And this is the same space. I'm showing four images from the same kitchen 
from different sides. If you look at this kitchen, you will probably see, say, this is somebody's home, but not a facility. This is a care home. And and I, I really, but two things to point out. One is in this particular facility, the staff was very active, including the administration, to really go out to furniture auctions and get furniture that would be relevant for the German the population that they are there. They can relate to these elements. You know, some of these elements are more reminiscence oriented, but there are many elements that are everyday use. The cabinets, they have a they have a washer dryer as well and so on. And I, I do want to draw your attention to this image. I, I just love this image, and I show this in many places. These are the two residents here, and this is a, a staff, and the residents are, are cutting apples. And this is, again, goes back to not only the familiarity aspect of a kitchen, but a kitchen table, and something they have done many, many times before they moved into the care home. This is a familiar activity. Most of these residents don't don't have much verbal capacity. Then they are they say a few things, but they are quite uh, they are able to, to carry on certain things. So in my in my books, this is an example of participation, uh, an example of meaning, purpose, and inclusion. So staff work desks. So we talked about you know, briefly about the dominant nurses station, and there are examples in many countries and many care homes about how this can be. Um, you know, conceptualized differently and designed differently as well. In this particular example, I'm showing you a, a de work desk that is part of uh, the social space, but which is typically closed as a cabinet. But when it's open, it becomes a work desk. So this is this this is one example where it is used when needed, not open 24/7. So and there are other examples like this in the kitchen. There are certain regulations that we have to look at you know, in terms of um, sensitive information being locked and so on. But the point is, how can we more be creative in providing staff work areas that can be in, in, in part distributed maybe in some, in some cases as part of a social space for the residents in the main household. And in some cases, maybe they are outside the, um, outside the unit. But uh, as, as much as possible to be integrated in the unit so that staff don't have to go out. So, uh, so this is probably, you know, many, uh, uh, well known for many of you, the village model the, that, that, was, that was made famous by the, the village in the Netherlands. But there are now many villages across the world. Well, uh, the one in Germany, one in England, um, one in France. There's... Uh, there, there are two, well, at, at least one in BC and the one that is under construction in BC. So I will, uh, I'll just show you a few images of the one that we have in British Columbia. As far as we know, this is the only care home based on the village model in Canada. So this is a, in the private sector, the village Langley, you're showing here, you're seeing here the, the artist sketch. But that's the overall plan of the site. And we basically have six households. Each household has two units. So I'll show you the floor plan in a minute. But two households connected with some common staff area. So there are three, uh, well, basically six households connected to each other. And then you got on one side, the community building. That's where the entrance is. That's where many of the common facilities common amenities class destinations are, are taking place. So the main concept for a village is basically that we are going back to the issue about lifestyle. How can, how can we provide an environment that support normalization of behavior and support lifestyle-based activities? And one of the things that is challenging in most care homes is do we have an outdoor space or can we go out to the community? That happens in most places if the staff is taking out or the family is taking out the residents for field trips or outings and so on. So being able to go out of my home without any barrier, that is fundamentally challenging or un, you know, um, absent in most care homes in Canada. So in this case, most all of these uh, units 
don't have locked doors. You just go out and, and walk around. It's a well-landscaped uh, space that we will see in a minute that you are free to walk around and go to the common amenities as well. So this is the common building space, uh, which has, as you come in, you have like a cafe uh, or, um, environment and there's an activity room, there's a barber shop, um, there's a general store, et cetera. So, and this is the floor plan of 30, the residents, um, the, the household. So this is one household having 13 uh, residents. The other side has 13 residents as well. And there's a common space for staff workspace and some ancillary activities. So um, just to show you some glimpses of how the space looks like, this is the main space as you come into the building, the common building, and that's the, the Elroy's Cafe, and people can hang out. And this is actually well used. I have been there many times. If you go there, you'll see that the morning activity taking place, there's an evening activity taking place, and people just come out from their own homes, and sometimes they come uh, with with uh, staff or family, sometimes they come on their own, people who are close to the space. There's a general store, um, which is functional to a point. Uh, they do have certain things which are used for the breakfast. So they do, they do have an operational kitchen, yes, on site. They don't cook in the households, uh, but they do prepare breakfast. And for the breakfast materials, the breakfast, the eggs and, and, and the milk and, and bread and so on are taken by staff. Sometimes residents would be take, uh, brought here or they would come on their own. They would check it out as a general store. Just get an idea about, um, you know, get a connection to what they are used to. So it's not, not exactly like what they had envisioned at, at the inception of the project. So it's, it's working to a certain point about to, its, um, to what it can uh, ultimately achieve. So this is the view of the whole village as you're going into the space, uh, the main space. And you can see the different um, units, different houses are colored differently and, and potentially helping for orientation. And there, there are signs um, of, uh, and there are certain signs that, that are also showing which direction you can go to. So this is the Cedar Cottage. Um, again, trying to create some of these uh, quintessential elements, architectural elements, the, the roof, the siding, the, the fencing, the front yard, front porch, and so on. So this is the, once you get in, this is the main social space, the social heart. Um, or part of the social heart is the main lounge slash living area. And then there's, this is the secondary space, which is actually used most, most commonly for different activities. And then there's a dining space, which has got so two tables and slightly bare. They can do more work and make it more home-like, obviously. And, um, uh, but there is this, this attempt to create that household space scale. Uh, this is the kitchen. They do, um, this, is, this is a regulatory issue that we have in many jurisdictions about accessible kitchen. So that's, you know, in some cases, it's possible. In many cases, it's not. So even in this case, you know, residents are not able to get into the kitchen, but at least the kitchen is there, and and they would they have uh, they have counters as you can see, which are well used well used by the staff to engage residents when they do have common baking activities or when they set up um, the breakfast in the mornings. So yeah, the fridge would tell you that they are prepared for the breakfasts uh, that take place every day in the morning. Um, this is something they could have done differently on the lower hands, the, the image, the, the washer dryer. This is not in the household itself. It's in the common space between for the staff access only for the two households. And, and, and at, we have talked about this in a wee meeting when we have gone there from our team to this side and talked with the staff. And they would say, if we were to redo this, they would create, they would have a space in the main activity space of the household where there would be a washer dryer for activity oriented um, things rather than this is more like a, more like an actual operational uh, ongoing for major washer dryer, washer drying activity. Before I leave the topic of village, I do want to point out the second village that is taking that is under construction in BC, which we, our team is part of in terms of an evaluation project. So this is on Vancouver Island in Comox. And on the left-hand side, you can see the current care home, 
which is just uh, one side of this large, huge building here, which is the views, uh, it's called the views, and it's 156 residents in four bed semi, this used to be in a hospital actually, and this was converted at some point into a care home. So, and this on the right hand side, you see an artist sketch about uh, on the care village. So it's not exactly like, you know, the, the dementia village in the Netherlands or the one that we also have in Vancouver, but they tried to create, um, they tried to bring in several common amenities like a bistro, a childcare center, art studio, a community space, an indigenous um, community center as well. So these are all part of this space. And then each, each, each of these are like um, 10, 10 resident households. So we are engaged uh, in conducting a pre and post relocation a project evaluation of the project. So we have been collecting data uh, at this care home, which is the existing care home. This is under construction currently, and it's scheduled to open fall of 24, where we will go back and collect data with some of the similar methods um, to see how the, the data compares with the baseline data. So moving along, um, the, the second design principle that I want to share with you is, uh, is the issue about orientation and meaningful walking. Orientation basically refers to spatial and temporal orientation. Do I know where I am? Okay, and what space is this for? What time is this? So mostly spatial orientation. What is the space for? And meaningful walking. We know many people with dementia pace, walk, and that's a whole another topic in itself. But the, the point here is that do we have space that would allow, support, meaningful walking uh, without somebody getting lost uh, and getting anxious, as well as knowing when you are, when you have reached a destination, that's the orientation aspect. So easy access from resident room to lounge and dining spaces to so talk about the, the, how much, how many steps one has to take to get to the social spaces, right? Is it within reasonable range, like eight to 10 steps and you are there? Or do I have to go a long hallway and end of the hallway, I take a left turn and the right turn and I'm almost lost, or I, I get to a dead end, right? So that's connected to providing a safe and secure walking path. So this is this is in, in many care homes, you know, the long corridor with a dead end or a locked door, some 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 form of dead end. And then these, we know these contribute, these long corridors can contribute negatively in disorientation anxiety. People going there and getting getting feeling disoriented, having anxiety increases the risk of falls as people are walking along the hallway. There's, there's a walking path that is also beyond surveillance or beyond the the, the sight lines of the staff. Um, and in some ways, those first two lead to mobility dependence by organizational policies in keeping residents near the nurse's station, near the main activity area, and so on. So there are many implications um, in terms of not only residents, but also from staff perspective of how long corridors are really not helpful. These are two examples uh, from, from somewhere in Canada, uh, actually in, 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 in our province in BC. So these are spatially disorienting, very institutional, mobility challenging. And of course, uh, quite often they are source of high, the flooring has high glare. So speaking of walking path, this is one of the good examples that we have in Vancouver, going back to late nineties actually, where you have a 14 resident unit, so household is there, but the reason, reason I'm showing you this, this floor plan is an example of a looped walking path. A walking path which, which connects with the social spaces. So as I come out as a resident, I keep walking, I go back, go to the social spaces, or I come back if I'm keeping walk, keep, I keep my walking um, continued. Uh, as opposed to reaching a dead end. So the looped walking path is not the only solution. There are other solutions as well for meaningful walking path. So you can have a singular, single linear walking path with social spaces on both ends as well. And there are other models as well. But this is the main principle being that to avoid dead ends, to connect with meaningful social spaces and, 
and, and also opportunities for sitting and, and engaging with the environment uh, as people are walking. So easy vis visual and physical access from resident rooms, right? So the top one is uh, actually in, in, in BC, the lower one in, in Europe. So the main idea is that the, the importance of visual access, the sight line, as I'm coming out a resident from my room, what do I see? Do I see the social space? And if I see that, then that more likely I will get to that. So this goes back to the issue of cognitive map or mental map that is that is impaired in a person with dementia, right? So which is about the mental map that we carry every day and it helps us function moving around within a building, moving around in the city and so on. And, and that is that is not working, you know, when with a condition of dementia. And in, in that condition, in that circumstance, the visual connection is critically important to know what I'm what is possible and what I can do. So if I see the space simply, I know it's there. I'm and also physically accessible, I'm more likely to get there. End of the hallway seating reorientation, the issue that, you know, most care homes have many of these end of the whole situation. What do we do with these situations? This is where, you know, we talk about having a seating. Um, it can be as simple as, as a bench. It can be like a chair like that. It can be a bit more elaborate than that. So the point being that once people are walking and get to that location, two things happen. When you see this, we see the seating, that's a cue to sit down. That's an environmental cue to sit down. And if I'm sitting down as a resident, my visual field has changed. I'm, I'm reoriented towards where I came from. And, and I, I would likely to get up and go back rather than, rather than um, feeling anxious. On the left-hand side, this is a great story on the left-hand side. This is in Copenhagen, where the, before they had the chair, there, the door was open. This was a resident room. And there were, there were two residents who would come and all the time they would go into that room. And then they closed the door and that didn't help because they were frustrated. They couldn't open the door. And then they placed the, the chair. And, and, and she, there are two people there who would come here a few times a day and they would sit here for maybe 10 seconds, 15 seconds. And then they, they, was, they would get up and walk back to where they came from. This is a project in Vancouver where uh, the local Emily Carr Art Institute students were involved and, and a very simple way of changing the, the, the wall space next to the resident room. Uh, so this is what you had before. And this is, this is not the same room, but this is a quick demonstration of what can be done in low cost, you know, decals and, and, and images that you can put up to create differentiation diff to, to this is achieving two things, right? One is about it, it's changing the, the institutional quality of the space, but also providing cues that there's a difference, different artwork, different um, colors of the door that would, um, that would provide assistance for people to find their rooms. Um, so this is a company in, in the Netherlands that offer customized door overlay or decals that can be put on resident rooms. So there are a few care homes in Canada that have actually implemented this. There's one in New Brunswick, there are two in BC. Um, these are, so what you're looking at, these are these are overlay, these are decals, not, not the real door itself. There is a door, but there's an overlay that was put in to create that, that uh, personalized quality of the door. And, and in, in essence, you can imagine the whole corridor space can change. The quality of the space can change with different design of different doors. Um, yeah, so this is, um, these are from other projects and so on about memory boxes near uh, resident room doors. And just showing some examples how this can be done in, in different design, but fundamentally, the, the benefits or the impact, potential benefits include orientation cue, conversation starter for staff, then knowing the person through their objects and having a conversation and creating a home-like common space, but at least the, 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 the corridor space can be transformed. The third principle that I want to touch on is uh, stimulation. This is something we touched on uh, in, in, in direct way about, for example, the large 
uh, dining room, we talked about stimulation. So when we talk about stimulation, we're talking about stimulation from the social space, the social context and the physical context both. So, right, so more people, if you have a household, if you have a unit, if you have a facility that has 50 people and having their meals together, you can imagine the level of stimulation that can happen by, by the sheer presence of 40 other, 50 other people, residents and staff. And then the associated physical context, which is about the, the, the space itself, the furnishing, the lighting, the noise, all of these contribute to stimulation. So we talk about the, the reducing physical, environmental and social stimulation, but the, the issue is the finding that optimal stimulation. So we, we are not talking about uh, you know, creating like a clinical atmosphere, a setting where no stimulation is there. So it's finding the right balance. And when you talk about right balance of stimulation, it's important to talk about what is positive sensory environment. So what can we bring in as a positive sensory stimulation that is familiar, that is meaningful for a person to connect with and engage in positive activities without getting stress, without getting anxiety. So these are examples, some examples from different care homes about positive engagement opportunities. So this is, for example, a game in, in a facility in, in, in Europe, uh, in Sweden, where you know there are some residents would sit here and some of them would try to play, some of them would adjust and look at it and recognize it or say something about it. So that, that's potentially a cue. This is in Australia, where in the, in the corridor, you have uh, opportunities for connection with different scarves and hats. And these are, these are items that have different texture, different colors. So that's also a potential tactile stimulation. This is in Edmonton, the, um, the, the care home at the corner of a corridor, a hallway uh, uh, section, you have the plants and there's actually uh, on the left-hand side, you can see the, a glimpse of the, the, the sink and there's a watering can and, and, and staff would fill up the watering can with water. And there are certain residents who would go by and pick up the watering can and plant the, um, uh, you know, water the plants. And then there are a few residents who would go by 20 times and water the plants. Um, this is a, the, the this is also the same place in Edmonton, a small aviary uh, it, as part of their activity space and, and, and residents quite enjoy the, the birds, the noise from the birds and the, the, the birds chirping and then the, the movement of the birds. Uh, this, is, uh, this is from India. This resident um, used to be a teacher at school. And for her, the positive stimulation is a blackboard with chalks because this is what she has done day in and day out for many years. So she is not... In her mind, she can connect with this and 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 write things that lessons that she used to give in schools. This is this is common in many some Scandinavian countries to bring in elements of uh, rehab, so elements that could be typically in a rehab room or center location, bringing in like a stationary bike in the common space where it could be a stimulation for activity. The final principle that uh, that I am sharing with you is designed for functional support. And um, uh, this is to talk about, uh, to really think about the, the capacity, the remaining capacity uh, of the residents in, in, you know, toileting, in dressing and so on. So the goal here is what can be done in the environment and provide appropriate level of challenge at the same time but really to simplify the everyday task to more manageable scales. So this is, yeah, this is just going back a long time ago. I know that uh, in the audience, we have uh, Dr. Margaret Calkins. I know Maggie was involved in some of these projects of uh, visual access to toilet um, that increased exponentially independent toileting behavior. Um, also modified closet. So this is, uh, this is also drawing from the existing literature on how the closet can be divided. So the one side is, is closed, the other side is open for, um, for, for um, there's a, the one set of clothing that can be used by the staff 
uh, or in, in some cases, families. And I know I'm, I'm going to acknowledge the work from my Margaret Calkins. This is a project from Dr. Margaret Calkins. She, her team worked on this um, project of modified closets or for um, different populations, including people who are living in the community and how they could actually use this more effectively because they see through front ends and then the, the, the actual um, uh, elements can be taken out and then used more effectively. So um, Maggie, if you have any comments in the Q&A session, Q session, please add to what I just mentioned here. Um, finally, on the, this last uh, element of the design principle is uh, the furniture arrangement. So this is about the simple fact that how we organize our furniture can affect the quality of social interaction. And we know that there are two basically different ways of arrangement. One is sociopetal and sociofugal. And these relate to how, what activities are possible. So this is quite common in many care homes where you know, chairs lined up against the wall. Even if, even if they're not lined up, they're, they're formed as a group. The, the maintenance staff would come in and they would push back all the chairs at the end of the, uh, for against the walls to, to really clean the floor. So in some cases, they're, you know, they are for watching TV, but watching TV is, should not be a main activity in a care home. So, but by default, quite often we see these just as a status quo and they are not supportive of social interaction because as we know that uh, we need to see the other person's face especially for older adults, it's, it's difficult to rotate the body, but it's just not for any, any older person, it's for anybody to have a meaningful conversation. You want to have a physical connection, physical uh, visual connection with the face. On the other hand, uh, the opposite of sociophagal would be sociopetal, that would be supportive of social interaction. It's about grouping or furnishing in small groups. It could be around the table, it could be a more lounge oriented seating arrangement within a short distance so people can see each other, people can have a uh, potential connection in some, some level. So chairs at 90 degrees or less angles with each other and small cluster furnishing for small groups. So that's fundamentally the, the idea of so sociopedal arrangement. This is something that can be done easily in many care homes with the rearranging furniture for small groupings. This is more possible when we have small group, small activity spaces, but even large activities can be divided, partially divided into smaller sections to, to support these smaller arrangements. I'm gonna change gears and talk about uh, two other projects that we are working on. One is uh, the environmental assessment tool that I mentioned earlier which is we have a call, we are calling it person-oriented environmental tool. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Heather Cook, worked with our team on this. Um, so this tool is, uh, is um, uh, there are two components. And one component is focused on spaces. Um, so we look at, the, in this component, in this module, the first module, we look at different spaces, activity space, um, dining space, main corridor, and so on, and, and, and look at different elements of the activity space or whatever space that might be, and then score them low, moderate, high. We also have a module two, which is about real-time assessment. So this is an attempt to look at a, the current resident's behavior and capturing those behaviors in certain, you know, you know it depends on, that. that's an open-ended option that, if you're using POET, you can use your own tool to, to document resident behavior and connect with your module two, which is the physical and environmental features, the, those are the codes. So one important goal that we have for this second module, real-time assessment, is to identify small scale changes that the, the staff can do, which can be changing the furniture arrangement, which can be bringing in elements, objects that people can engage with in a meaningful way. So yeah, so as I mentioned, module one is a walkthrough assessment. Module two is observation of environmental categories with residents' behavior. Uh, this is a walkthrough observation, the first part. 
where we rate the quality of the physical environment in key spaces, and we focus on both discrete and global aspects. So, um, so discrete might be what type of furnishing do we have? A global might be what is the quality of lighting do we have? Uh, it takes about 30 to 40 minutes, one-time observation. So these are the uh, spaces, seven spaces that we look at through this walkthrough observation. Um, so there are other observational tools that are out there that are more focused on, on therapeutic goals or performance uh, expectations like uh, wayfinding or social interaction. We try to build in some of those goals, the activity-based goals, desired ex goals as part of our assessment description rather than the main focus um, of this tool. So the main focus is more about as, as, a, as an observational unit is it's the space itself. So these are some pages just to give you an idea about you know, the, uh, this is from the manual. Each space, for example, in this case, activity space has different elements. So in this case, I'm showing location and access as an element. And then we, the trained mapper would look at the activity space and among other things, would look at location and access and, and rate them as low, moderate, or high. So in this case, how easily the activity space is um, accessible by the residents from their rooms. Um, furniture grouping, so uh, that can be low, moderate, or uh, high. And then scale or size of the space. So this has an important um, implication of to what extent I'm creating a home-like space, to what extent I'm able to have uh, furniture grouping and so on. So the scale, scale of the dining room in this case. The module two is about environmental categories, which can be used in conjunction with an activity, a chart, activity table, and, and linking with activities uh, or behaviors that are observed of the residents and what are the environmental elements that are uh, observed in that context, in that vicinity. So these are the, the environmental categories that our team identified as the more, well, more commonly uh, cited, used in design guidelines and has more evidence base and combination of those two have led to these, these categories. So as you can see, uh, each of these categories are mentioned with E and then uh, and one other alphabet. So EA means arrangement of furniture, EC means cues and so on. So just as an example, um, the category EA is arrangement of furniture, and it has got e, e, D, EA as a detractor. Um, so EAD, without getting into technical, yeah, environmental uh, arrangement of furniture has a positive as a detra uh, enhancer, a detractor. In this case, we're looking at the, the detractor, that in, the, in this instance, it is a detractor, or in this instance, is this an enhancer. So this is one, one example, one category that a mapper would, would code along with what the behavior might be, which is um, with it's something like this. So there are different versions of this rest and behaviors. And then you know we have rest and behaviors on one side and environmental category on the other side. So that's what we can use in, in 10 minute timeframes. My final section uh, is to share with you uh, a game that uh, we have recently developed. It's called Creating Home. So we have been working uh, for some time on and off with the local health authorities in, in coming up with an educational module for, for staff in, in making small scale changes and also educating administrators about major changes renovation that they could do. So we could think about uh, didactive method, giving one hour lecture and some other method, and that's, that's fine to a point. But we want to create something that is more portable, that is easily accessible by staff, and, and, and actually leaders in the care home, activity leaders, nursing staff, or other care leaders can use with their peers, with their, with their team on their own. 
uh, once they once they understand the purpose and and the the use of this. So this particular game basically has, a, as I say, it's like a old fashioned game board, um, um, and where you basically looking at is is the space in the care home. So uh, and there's a there's a set of cards, and I'll explain that in a minute. Um, and there's a there's a you can pick one of these. So five players can play this. And then these are typically would be five uh, staff. And then they would pick one of these and then they would have a dice and they would throw and they would start the game, right? So how does this work? So basically you would, um, you have a game board like this. You've got uh, five starting points, one, two, three, four, five, the yellows. And then you have uh, the typical spaces, social spaces like the dining area, the activity area. The, we put in a kitchen, not all, all care homes have a kitchen, but we said, okay, let's have one because it's, it's, it's something that we're promoting. That's it's important element uh, space to have in, in a household. We have a public washroom, we have an outdoor space. So that's, that's where the foundation is, the, the game begins. And there are four types of cards, player cards, destination cards, circulation, barrier and circulation facilitator cards. So when people are playing this game, they are basically taking a persona. So you would you would take a persona of a resident. So in here you see five personas that have been created. Um, and each player one, each player would take the persona, in this case, Dorothy, on one side you see an image, uh, uh, an illustration of the person, but on the other side, you see who the person is, what is her cognitive status, or what is her past um, you know, lifestyle, who is she? So giving a sense of both her cognitive slash physical function, as well as who the person is. So we try to promote really the whole, you know, the importance of person-oriented, person-directed care, person-centered care to understand the person's biographical information. So we included some of that in each of these personas, along with some of the challenges, some of the functioning issues they, they might be facing. So there's a, there's a collection of uh, circulation barrier cards. So, you know, at, at the way it was started, some, as, as you're playing the game, you would pick up a card for destination, um, and then you would you would want to go to a dining room, and then you would start going towards that, throwing your dice. And then if you get to a stop sign, then you are facing a barrier. And once you face a barrier, you pick up a, a, a barrier card. So a barrier could be, you know, as it says here, it could be disorienting hallway. It could be handrail and equipment. It could be floor glare and poor lighting. Or if you, if you land on a, a go point, a go symbol, you pick up a facilitated card where it's about positives, maybe a familiar object that you can see, or there's adequate lighting or visual access to social space. Once you get uh, to uh, the destination, there are also barriers or facilitators. The, the objective is here at this point is to show how uh, a dining room can be positive or negative in terms of the furniture arrangement, in terms of the scale and so on. So in this case, we are seeing barriers. So how what not to do in, in a dining room, what's, what's not, not a positive environment for the kitchen. So you see the kitchen, but you'll notice there's a, there's a locked, there, it, it, inaccessible, that there's a half door here, right? So you can't really, you can get, you see the kitchen, but you can get to the kitchen. You have an activity area, really few chairs and tables, no objects, public washroom. How do I know that's a washroom? Although that is a washroom. Uh, bedroom, very bare bedroom, nothing much to talk about, nothing to recognize. And there are other uh, barrier cards as well, okay, different kinds of, what we did was for the bedrooms, you see five bedrooms, and actually five bedrooms are connected to five personas, okay, and these are the barrier, but once you get there, actually corresponding five positive bedrooms, before you see that in the next slide, these are destination facilitators, so dining room looks quite different, it's a much more home-like small group dining, accessible kitchen, an activity area where you see some props and activity uh, elements. You see a graphic symbol of the toilet. 
you see the bed, this is where the bedrooms begins. Each of these bedrooms are connected to the five personas, which connects to their lifestyle at some level. Okay, so there is, there. for example, you see the, the racing car, the image of that, that is connected to one persona who, whose hobby is um, to, to know about cars and, and, and understanding about racing cars in particular. So that, that's her, his symbol. Uh, to come to. So that we try to connect. There's an artist here as well. So there's a facilitator's guide, and the guide is to uh, help a facilitator, ideally, is somebody from the facility who would go through this and understand what is this about and how can you, what is the purpose of this game, what are the goals of this game, who should play the game, how to arrange the session, and how long. Typically, it's about 30 minutes. So in 30 minutes, you can have a game. And then but the important part is the second half where you have a discussion. So I'll get to that in a minute. So, and then the, the discussion, the facilitator's guide goes into the types of cards and player cards and so on. But this part is important because it's, the objective is to get to the discussion in a meaningful way and ask some questions. And these are some possible questions and they, people can have their own questions. So we can start with the question, what did you learn from today's session? If you had a magic wand, what feature would you change first? How would you change this? And so on. How can all changing the environment also affects your work environment? Okay, so, so that, that's the idea to have that conversation going. And, and hopefully this will elevate their understanding and increase their environmental competency that, yeah, there are certain things that we knew are relevant impact the, the residents here, but I know better now why they do that, why this is impacting that and how we can make something different. So basically it's an engaging in the topic in a fun way. And we also uh, have an evaluation section where the participants would give feedback to the facilitator, how did the session work, how could be different and what we could do in our, in our own home whatever the, the, that home might be. So this is something we haven't tried yet uh, formally. We have talked, we have gotten input from a um, number of uh, care staff uh, as, we, as we created the game, but we, have, we haven't really formally um, tried it out in, in, in certain care homes with staff to see what they really think as they play the game. So that's, to, to, that's in the coming months. Uh, our, our our goal is to first do a pilot study and 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 use some a few care homes engaged in that and then uh, based on their feedback make some changes if needed as needed and then we are in discussion with the uh, Vancouver Coastal Health Authority that this could potentially be part of their um, ongoing training some of the training that they are already doing as part of the person centered care training. Okay, I think that is my last slide. All right, it is. So thank you so much. That's it from my end. Thanks for your attention.